So, hey, let's pray and we'll get going. Father, I thank you for each and every person. I pray that you bless them, touch them, minister life to them. Father, I pray that you would take the words that I'm about to say and translate them into each and every person's heart so they can hear on the inside what we're talking about. Father, have your way, and I know you will, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, come on, everybody says amen. amen. All right, so what I want to talk about this weekend, we're going to kind of conclude this series because next weekend, Easter weekend, come on, somebody. It's the greatest weekend, greatest holiday, and I love it, love, love Easter. Uh, but in that, you know, uh, this weekend, kind of kind of land the plane with this. And I'll be very honest with you, this message is kind of hard, and, I, and I'll tell you why it's hard. Because I'm talking about something that you almost feel as much as you sense, as much as, as you, you know it. And, and, and you're like, what are we talking about? Oh, just wait. So here it is. Uh, I want to talk about why we love God's house, you know, and and this is the part where I'm talking about the feel. We love God's house. You know, I told you, the, the God's house, when we talk about it like that, it's not just a building. It isn't a building. It's the people. Y'all getting what I'm saying? But what makes this people group different than other people groups? People at different places. What, what makes this group different is God's presence. I can tell we need to go there for a minute. It's God's presence. That's what separates it. So, so get this. We understand that the church is the people. It's not the building. But what happens in the building makes this building different than every other building. Come on, am I right? All right? This is where lives are transformed. People are healed, blessed, saved, delivered. All right, I got three amens. So, okay, we're going. It's going to be a long Monday morning. Or sun, what is this? Sunday? <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> I don't even know what day of the week it is. But anyway, it's going to be. But, but, but here's the deal. You ready? But God's presence here changes everything. It really does. Let me give you, an, give, give you a couple of examples of this. So, believe it or not, I, there are very few things in life that I remember the first time I encountered it. Okay? Very few things. But this one. God's presence, I remember the first time I encountered it. I, I remember it. Now, you may be, not be this way, but when I was 12 years old, gave my heart to Christ, Baptist church, gave my heart to Christ, but I didn't get on fire for God. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I was still a rebellious teenager. Come on, that doesn't come as a shock, does it? <laughs> I'm on my way to heaven, but it's only by the grace of God. <clears throat> so, long story short of it is, a couple years later, I was probably about 14 or 15. All right, I remember I was a rebellious somebody. And I did not want to go. But my parents made me go with them to a little bitty church. If you're traveling from Kokomo to Muncie, Indiana, the church is on the left-hand side, right past uh, I-69. All right? And um, it's a little white church. They, they've since built a building on the back of it, but the, it, at one time it was just a small little country steeple church. And I remember going there, I'm about 14, 15 years old, going there for, a, watch this, it was like a Friday night, I'd have much rather been at the skating rink, come on somebody, shuffling and DJing baby or something. But instead I got drugged to this, watch this, the Isaacs were singing there. Now, now some of you are like excited already. All right, but when you're 14 and you show up to a country church and you'd rather be at the skating rink and everybody, they, they, they weren't even carrying guitars, they were carrying guitars. <laughs> y'all ain't getting it like I got it. They had banjos, they, had a, they didn't have drums, they had a bass drum. Boom, 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 boom. And at 14 years old, I'm like, listen, Def Leppard is a whole lot better than this. <laughs> you know, I don't know why we can't play some Oreo Speedwagon or something. And I'm sitting there, somebody, somebody said amen to that. All right, anyway. <laughs> Sinners. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Oh, oh I, got a, I, I got something in my message. You'll feel comfortable. Don't worry. So I'm sitting there, and, uh, and I'm sitting there, and I did not want to be there. And they started singing. And I'm telling you, it was not my style of music. It was not what I wanted to be a part of. 
There was probably only 150, maybe 200 people. I don't really know. You know, when you're a kid, sometimes the numbers are skewed in your mind as far as how many people were there. But it was a very small building. And I tell you, they got going. And I'm telling you, as rebellious as I wanted to be and as much as I hated being there, I thought, oh, my Lord, something going on in here. It was at that point. Listen to this, everybody. It was at that point. You could not convince me from that point forward that there was no God. Because something happened in the room that wasn't there when I got there, that when they started picking and grinning, (laughs) I'm telling you, the place came alive. It was electric in there. And there was no electric guitar. And they just started singing and worshiping. And I was like, oh my. I had goosebumps. And I kid you not, if you were to go back in time and look at me, I was... You know what I mean? But I'm telling you, the place was electric, and I was like, oh, my goodness. And I remember thinking in my mind, you know what? You can say what you want, but you can never say there is no God now. You can never say there is no God. And I remember that. I mean, I'm I'm just a teenager, and I remembered that. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, the presence of God is so awesome. And since then, I've experienced it a lot. As a matter of fact, I try and live in that place. I remember uh, year, I got out of the military in 97, and when I came back, uh, Michelle had signed me up to go on the Million Man March, where, where Promise Keepers had this million man gathering of Christian men at the mall in Washington, D.C. And I remember getting there, and they were all singing And as far as you could see, we're just men singing and worshiping God. And I'm telling you, the presence of God, it was thick. You know what I mean? Let me give you the opposite. So several years ago, I think, I don't want to point out anybody, but I think that REO Speedwagon thing came from right around here. Uh, But uh, uh, I think it was her, actually. But anyway, uh, but but with that being said, uh, I remember several years back, uh, Michelle got me a ticket. So, so two groups that I've loved ever since I was a kid is Credence Clearwater Revival, because that's swamp music. Come on, if you're from Louisiana. I was kind of disappointed when I heard that they, they, they made those songs and they had never even been to Louisiana. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and they had that and they had ZZ Top. All right, they had those two touring and they were down at, uh, what do they call it now? At Deer Creek. They were at Deer Creek, all right? And uh, Michelle got myself and Michael tickets to go to that because Michael and I, you know, Mike listens to it. And ZZ Top, you know, they had a 34 Ford. Come on. Yeah. Cruising down the highway. And, uh, well, anyway, all right, anyway. I remember getting there and, being kind of excited to be there, never been to a concert in my life, just to be honest, never had, you know, <laughs> I grew up poor. So I get there and they started the music and everything, and, and I'll be honest with you, at the end of the night, whenever we left, I was kind of disappointed. And I was disappointed not because they didn't do a great job, these are phenomenal musicians, these are, these are fantastic people, they can play anything, they can do anything, this is several years back. And I know what you're thinking. Pastor went to it. Don't, don't say that. I've seen some of you there. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. <laughs> All right, so whatever. But, but I remember leaving there going, well, it was okay. And, and I remember leaving there going, man, you know what I enjoyed way more than that? I went to a Michael W. Smith concert one time where the presence of God was thick. I'm telling you, I'd rather do that 50,000 times more than one of those concerts. And I realized, that was the last concert I went to, and I realized right then that what matters to me more than anything is God's presence in a place. So I love God's presence. And this is why I tell you that this is a hard message to preach because it's something that unless you're in it, it's hard to explain it. But once you've experienced, it's hard to deny it. Can I get an amen on that? And, and here's, here's my heart in this, all right? I want you to understand that we should never take that for granted. We should never, I know you come in here, every week people come in and they sing and they're like, oh, that, that feels pretty good and everything and they leave and that, that, that's that. And, but then you go home and maybe you worship during the week. 
You know, and you're worshiping at home and you sense God's presence. You're like, oh, man, that God, that's good, you know. I mean, never take that for granted. Live for that, matter of fact. I would, say, I would say that your heart's desire should be to want to live in God's presence all the time. And, and in that, I want to show you some of the benefits of what happens in your life whenever you do live for God's presence. Now, I will tell you this. Listen to me. God's presence affects different people in different ways. If you're a believer, it's going to do one thing for you, but if you're not a believer, it's going to affect you in a different way, all right? And this is why I'm not shocked sometimes whenever people don't want to be in God's presence. That goes all the way back to the Bible. So let's kind of get into it, and I want to show you something about God's presence, all right? And I, I want to take a story from a gentleman's life, but it's going to take me a couple hours to get there, all right? So here, here we go. First of all, let me break this down for you. Under the Old Covenant, Old Testament, all right? From Genesis to Malachi, you, well, not actually from Genesis, actually from Moses giving the law to Malachi, you will find out that God lived in this. This was the, a box. This is called the Ark of the Covenant. If you know anything about Indiana Jones, he was looking for it. All right? <laughs> but, but the Ark of the Covenant is very, very important, especially to the Jewish people and, and, and literally to our faith. And the reason it is important is because God resigned himself to this box in the Old Covenant, all right? Now, he's not there now, and I'll explain that here in a minute. But the reality is, this is where God lived. This was the Shekinah, is what it's called in the Hebrew, and the Shekinah was God's presence, and it was reserved for this box only. Now, in that, I want to tell you there were three articles inside this box. There was, number one, there was Aaron's rod that budded, which speaks of God's supernatural power. There was manna, which I believe is Cocoa Rice Krispies, praise God. <laughs> Come on, where are my Cocoa Mara? Come on, you know that stuff sent from heaven. <laughs> All right. But anyway, there was manna in there, and the, and the word manna means what is it? Now you know, Cocoa Rice Krispies. But that speaks of God's supernatural provision. So Aaron's rod speaks of supernatural power. Uh, the the uh, manna is supernatural provision. God always provides. And then the last portion was, get this, the law. The Ten Commandments were in this box, which speaks of God's standard, God's holiness, God's righteousness. Okay? That becomes important here in a few minutes whenever we talk about a man touching the box. But the reality is, this is where God dwelled. Now, above it, we're two cherubims. The, the word cherubims is kind of a unique word. A lot of people think it's angels that are actually touching. But that's not actually what, what is going on here. This is called the Ark of the Testimony. Everybody say testimony. This is the testimony. So watch this. The two cherubim witness to something. All right? What do they witness to? Every year on the Day of Atonement, the Jews would take sacrifice, a sacrificial lamb, the one that was, was innocent, they would take and shed its blood. They would allow the scapegoat to be released. And they, they would confess all their sins over the scapegoat. And then they would send it on, on its way as a representation of you and I. The lamb that had no sin in it, they would sacrifice it, which is a testimony of, okay, we're, come on, everybody say Jesus. All right. And they would take that blood and then they would sprinkle it over this altar. And this was then called, listen, the mercy seat. The mercy seat. So the blood. So what did the two cherubim witness to? They're actually, it actually represents God the Father and God the Holy Spirit giving testimony that the blood has been shed and that the people are forgiven. Getting what I'm saying, everybody? Okay, in light of that, this is what went on. So this becomes a very important because without this, listen to this, everybody. Without this, the children of Israel had no indication as to God forgiving them of their sin. And they had no indication that God was with them. As long as they had the box, it was good because they could get right with God. But when the box was gone, they didn't know where they stood with God. Can I get a big amen on that? Okay, so now watch. Let me show you how it works. So whenever the children of Israel would be disobedient, they would end up being taken over by their enemies, and their enemies would steal the box. Because they knew if they stole the box, they stole their power. Does that make sense, everybody? So now, let's go. So you have the Philistines come in, and they steal the box. <laughs> I love this. I told you that God's presence affects different people in different ways, especially the enemy. 
So let me pick it up right here. And again, this is first found in 1 Samuel chapter 5. I would encourage you, if you're reading something this week, read 1 Samuel chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 to bring you up to speed. It's fascinating, all right? But the Philistines, they stole the box. They put it in front of their god, Dagon. They set it there in the evening. The Bible says they woke up the next morning and Dagon and fell on his face in front of the Ark of the Covenant. That's right, baby. Every false god's going to bow to the real god. Amen? Amen. So, so it bows. You know, they got a problem with it. Well, next thing you know, this verse pops in. Here's what it says. And so it was after they had carried it away that the hand of the Lord was against the city for, for, well, in very great destruction. And he struck the men of that city. Watch this. You're going to love this. It was a real pain. Both small and great with tumors which broke out in them. Now, I like the new King James, but I think the old King James says it a little clearer. The old King James says that they broke out with hemorrhoids <laughs> in parts undisclosed. <laughs> Come on, y'all getting what I'm saying? This is before they had the commercials for all this stuff to fix it, all right? They had issues. So they stole the Ark of the Covenant. Now all the men break out with hemorrhoids. Now they got issues. It's a real pain in the, you know what I mean? All right, so check this out. So look at the next verse. So therefore they sent the Ark of the Lord to Ekron. I bet. Let's get rid of the box. All right? So they shipped this thing away. Now watch what goes on. And so it was that the ark of God came to Ekron, and that the Ekronites cried out, saying, (laughs) they have brought the box of the ark of God to Israel, to us, to kill us and our people. (laughs) Great. They got hemorrhoids. Who knows what we're going to get? You know? So they're like, we got to get rid of this thing. So, So here's what the plan was. So they call out to the prophet, Samuel comes along, the prophet, and they go, hey, sir, we'd like to return the box to Israel. Now, I love this because but he's like every good preacher. He's a good preacher. Samuel goes, I'll tell you what, we'll take the box back, but here's only one thing. Load it full of your gold and silver and then send it back. <laughs> you might as well take up an offering. All right, so they literally, they load it full of their gold and silver, and they send it back. They put it on an ox cart, and they send it back. The children of Israel, they receive it back. Now, now what's interesting about this statement is, I, wanted you, I want you to see that God's presence to them, listen to this, everybody, God's presence affects everyone differently, and here's the deal. To the enemy, the ark, the ark the, God's presence was a curse. God's presence is a curse. To those who don't know Jesus and those who are anti-God, God's presence is an, is an abomination to them. It annoys them. It bothers them. can't even tell you how many people I've ministered to. Uh, I remember ministering to this one young lady, and I, I, obviously we believe that the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us. The Bible is very clear about that. And I was ministering to her, and I laid my Bible down on the table as I began to minister to her, and she's like... Remove the Bible from here. Remove the Bible from here. And, and, and she had a demonic spirit. And I was like, no, no, no. It's not going anywhere. But that spirit in you is going somewhere here in just a minute. I'm going to get that thing out in Jesus' name. Are you following me? So understanding that God's presence to some people is, is an offense. Now get this, everybody. So they got the Ark of the Covenant and they bring it back to the children of Israel. Now check this out. 1 Samuel 7, 1 says, and then the men of K- uh, Kerja Jermaine came and took the ark of the Lord, and they brought it into the house of Abinadad. Everybody say Abinadad. Come on, Peru, everybody. Say Abinadad. Abinadad. Now, Abinadad is a Jew. He, he's, there. he's there to take care of the box, the ark of the covenant. So Abinadad on the hill and consecrated Ele- Eleazar, his son. So, so now watch, everybody. Here is the presence of God. This is the box. This is is where God lives. And what does he do? He brings it into his home and he goes, yeah, whatever. How many of you know if if you don't care about something, you give it to your kids? (laughs) Anybody ever let their kids watch their kids? (laughs) You'll get that later. Uh, But if you really want something destroyed in your house, what you do is you give that thing to the kids. And how many of you know in no time, They're going to wipe it out. So he delegates 
the, the care of the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence, to his son. He doesn't even take responsibility for it. He's like, yeah, bring it into my house, whatever, set it over here. Here's my point, you ready? Abinadad, the ark was useless to him. Matter of fact, let's read on, look at this verse. First Chronicles, it said, and David said to the assembly, now mind you, 20 years has passed, and it's still in Abinadad's house. You're gonna find that out in the next slide. So the ark of the covenant, God's presence, is in Abinadad's house. For 20 years, it's sitting in there. Now watch what happens. Saul has been king, now Saul is dead, now David is king. First thing David does is says, you know what? If we're going to have a great nation, guess what we need? We need God's presence. We got to go get God's presence. Now remember, under the old covenant, he was in a box. Let's go get God's presence. Look what happens. So David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it is good to the Lord our God, let us send out our brethren everywhere who are left in all the land of Israel, and with them the priests and the Levites who are in their cities and their common lands, that they may gather together to us and let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we have not inquired of it in all the days of Saul. In other words, watch this, 20 years went by and no one asked, where's God? How sad is that? You know? So where is it? Where is it? It's at Abinadad's house, right? So, look at the next verse. It goes on. And so the, they set the ark of God on a new cart, okay, which is wrong. All right, years ago, I preached a message called Ox Cart Christianity. Uh, yeah, it was good. It was like two hours long. It was awesome. <laughs> ox Cart Christianity. You say, what's Ox Cart Christianity? Listen to me. It's when you try to move God's presence on boards and big wheels. Y'all ain't getting it like I said it. When you try and move the presence of God on boards and big wheels and not on the priest's shoulder. See, the presence of God belongs on the priest's shoulder under the old covenant, not in boards and big wheels. They thought they could manufacture God's presence and move it the way they wanted to. It doesn't work that way. God has to dictate the terms how, the God, how his presence is moved. There's a lot I could say about that, but let me go on. It goes on. So they set it on a cart, and they brought it out of the house of who? Abinadad, 20 years later. 20 years. Now, is there any indication that Abinadad is blessed? No. Because to Abinadad, it's just a useless box taking up space in his house. He sees no value in it, all right? He goes on to say, which was on the hill in Uzzah in Ohio. <laughs> Come on, that's some great names, right? All right? And the sons of Abinadad, the sons of Abinadad drove the new cart. Now, let me ask you this. So the sons were dedicated to taking care of it. So guess what? They get to drive the cart. Do you think this is going to go well? If you really want your stuff torn up, let your kids drive your car. So here they are driving this cart. They're taking it down the road. It says, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadad, which was on the hill, accompanied the ark of God, and Ohio went before the ark. Now watch this next part. This is, becomes very important. And then David and all the house of Israel, they played music before the Lord and all kinds of instruments and fir wood and harps and stringed instruments and on the tambourines, and they're just having a party. You get the idea. Look at the next verse. It says, and when they had come to Nacom's Na uh, threshing floor, Uzzah, put his hand out to the ark of God, and he took a hold of it. His name become Upsa at this point, because for the oxen had stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Upsa. I changed his name. And God struck him, therefore, before his error. You know, for years, this bothered me. This bothered me, because, and some of you may be there too. You might be saying, well, well they're trying to do a good thing. They're trying to take the ark of the covenant back to, to Jerusalem. Why is God angry? I'll tell you why God's angry. God's angry because they're breaking something that they don't even know about. Okay? So, so what was it? Watch this, everybody. Let me read the rest and then I'll explain. It says, and he died there by the ark of God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place, <laughs> bad day for Uzzah to this day. That isn't what it translates. I just made that up. All right. And so, so why is this so bad? 
And I've had people in the past ask me, why was Uzzah killed for what he did? I'm going to explain it to you and give it to you. Now, there's a lot I could say about it, but I, I only got a couple hours. So here we go. You ready? Here it is. Here it is. You remember this is where God's presence dwells. Why was God angry? Okay, watch. What is in the box? Aaron's rod. Manna. What was the other one? Ten Commandments. What does the law do? The law makes everyone guilty of sin. There is no justification of the law. You can't live by the law and expect to be justified in the eyes of God. Can I... The law points that everyone is a sinner. Watch this. You cannot approach, listen to me, you cannot approach God from the side of the box and live and be justified. Because the side of the box is where the Ten Commandments are that says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if you come to God through the law, you will always be judged for your sin immediately. That's what the law does. But where did God tell them to meet him? Listen to this. Look at this verse. It's very interesting. And there I will meet you. This is in Exodus. And I will speak to you from, help me out, above the mercy seat. So watch this. If you come to God on the side, you're coming through the law. If you come to God through the law, it will say you're guilty of sin and it must be judged. And the judgment of sin is always death. But if you're going to encounter God, you have to come through the mercy of the sacrifice of Christ so that you can come before him and be justified by the blood of Jesus and be right with God and live in his presence. You following it? You connecting the dots. So it's important that we understand that it's the sacrifice that made you justified in the eyes of God, not the touching of the box. So when Uzzah approached the box from the side, he was coming through the law, and because he came through the law, he was judged for his sin immediately. Now watch this, everybody. This is why you can't come to God without the sacrifice of Jesus. Because it's only in the blood of Jesus that we have been redeemed, we have been sanctified, we have been made as if we have been justified, just as if we had not sinned, why we come through the mercy of God, not the judgment of God. And let me just go with this one more second, you ready? Do you know that the lid on the box was perfectly matched to the size of the box? Here's what it means. The justice of God and the righteousness of God is equal to his grace, but grace overrides his judgment. Come on, somebody. That's fabulous. Fabulous. Now, in light of that, now you understand why Uzzah was judged. Because he approached God in a way that was not right. Look at the next verse, though. So to watch this. So let's, come, let, let, let's get it all together. So to the enemies, the box was a curse. The presence of God was a curse. Now watch this. To Abinadad, it was useless. It's just a box he put his kids over it. Watch this. To Uzzah, who did not understand how to approach God, it was death. There's one more dude, though, who understood. And, and, and I pray that this is who we are. Listen to this. So David was, a, I'm sorry, did I get, yeah, yep. So David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord uh, uh, with him into the city of David. Watch this. But David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained there in the house of who? Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Three months. Three months. How long was it in Obed-Edom's house? 20 years. How long is it in Obed-Edom's house? Three months. And watch this now. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. I love that. See, we think God's presence is only about blessing us. Nothing could be further from the truth. See, there is an invisible web that you can't see between the house of God and God's presence in your home. They are absolutely unified. When you live in God's presence, it doesn't just affect you. It affects you, your house, and all of your family when you carry the presence of God. And just a reminder, I want to remind you of this, that no longer is God in a box. The Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. You are the Shekinah presence of God. But I believe that there are some people who live like Abinadad. They live like Abinadad in the idea of this. You ready? God's in them, but he's useless. 
because he can't move through them. Because they see him as not doing anything. They see him as, well, I just don't know if it would benefit me. I just don't know if this or that or the other. And nothing could be further from the truth. When Obedidad, or I'm sorry, when Obed-Edom got that box to his house, he must have did something quite different. He honored that presence of God. He thought, my goodness, out of all the people in Israel, I've got God in my house. How many of you know everything changes when God gets in your house? Praise God. Everything changes. And he recognizes that. And he's like, oh my goodness, God's presence is here. And I'm here to tell you, listen to this. There are people, God's presence is there, but they don't acknowledge it. They don't, they don't see it. And because of that, they go, well, you know, I just, I just don't believe God can do this. I just don't believe God can do this. All the while denying his very presence right when he's right there the whole time. Not Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom started throwing a party. My goodness, I got God in my house. Praise God. You know it's about to get good. Now in that, watch this. I love this. You ready? Here's the way I see it. Whenever, whenever you care for what God loves, God loved that box only because it was how God approached the children of Israel. Listen, he will bless what you love. He will bless what you love. And Obed-Edom, from that point on, he is a different man. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to show you in the story over the next couple hours. I'm telling you, he is a different man. Listen to this, and I love this. This is where I got three points, three things that I pull out of this. Here's the first one I want you to see. Inviting God's presence into your life is the greatest moment of your life. When you invite God's presence in your life, it changes everything. When God starts taking up residence in you, your, your heart and in your life, See, a lot of times we invite God, God's presence into our heart, but have you invited him into your home? Have you invited him into your, your car on your way to work? Have you invited him into your finances? Have you invited him into everything in your life? Because I'm here to tell you, the more you let him in, the more he takes over, praise God. He will absolutely change everything. Amen? And listen, more than anything, let me just be real. You ready? More than your presence here, those of you in Peru, those of you online, more than you being here, do you know who I only care about who shows up? He's the only one I care about. I care more. Why? Because I know if he shows up, <laughs> I don't have, my job is easy. Praise God. He does the work. Not me. He does the work. When God's in the house, it changes everything. And again, I want to remind you back to my, you know, I went to a ZZ Top concert, Creedence Clearwater. Walked away going, eh. You go to a concert where you can worship God. Oh, you didn't want it to stop. You're like, my goodness, Lord Jesus. I mean, you can almost feel yourself floating out of there. Now, don't get weird. We weren't high. <laughs> Maybe on Jesus. That's about it, all right? But I'm here to tell you God's presence changes everything. It changes everything. When you say, oh, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, you know, you invited God's presence in. But when you invite him into your home, when you invite him to every aspect of your life, he changes everything. I was thinking about it like this just in my, in my own mind. Uh, the word presence is a very unique word, and I think it's cool. The word presence in the Hebrew, it means face or in front of. It means to see one's face. So when we're asking for God's presence and we're acknowledging God's presence, we're saying, God, I want to see you face to face. I want to talk to you face to face. God's presence is about taking, talking to him face to face. God, I just want to talk to you face to face. I want to meet with you face to face. I want to be in your presence, God. What does that mean, face to face? I know right now my grandson, Owen, when he wants Papa's attention, he'll get up beside me. You know what he does. And he grabs you by the cheeks and he turns to you, crackers, spit. You know what I'm saying? He turns your face like, Papa. I need your phone. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and he wants to make sure he has my undivided attention. And I was thinking about that with us and God. You know, sometimes you need to turn everything off. Get with God. You know what I mean? I believe there are times where he's trying to grab your cheeks. And he's just wanting to talk to you. He wants to meet with you face to face. The most important thing in your life is understanding that God wants his presence in your life. I was thinking about it like this, in God's presence, and I, these are just a few of them, and I didn't work really hard on this, but a little bit. Your past is erased when you're in your, it's amazing how whenever you come into God's presence, it, like, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. 
God's present, it wipes it away. Remember, the mercy seat deals with it. Listen to this. Your future is revealed. How about this? Your enemies are exposed. How many of you know your lack has to get back? Come on, somebody. I preach that. Your lack has to get back. You know, in God's presence, you realize that, hey, listen, there isn't nothing I don't need. Everything I need, God has already supplied. How about this? Your, your pain ha- can't remain. Your fear must disappear. And your sins are washed away completely under the blood of Jesus. Amen? You don't have to worry about it. In his presence, the Bible says, I love this verse, in his presence is fullness of joy. Look, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. Anybody ever been so in the presence of God, you're like, give me a wall. I can run through it. You know, you ever experienced God's presence? Okay, whatever. I have. I get so pumped up, man. I get so excited. I'm like, I don't know what to do with myself. I know some of you are like, that's just because you've had a couple of shots of espresso. That's not true. I don't drink Red Bull either because I don't need to fly. Praise God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He is my source. He is the one who helps me in, in the time of need. Can I get an amen on that? Listen to this. You ready? Look at this verse. And I love this. 2 Samuel says this. So we just read that. Everything Obed-Edom had in his house was blessed. You go just a few verses down and and you read this again. Now it was told to King David, saying. So David, he's in Jerusalem. Obed-Edom, he's at his house. So the Lord blessed all the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him. (laughs) Even his cows were prettier. All right? His, His yard was blessed. Everything because of how good Obed-Edom was. Because Obed-Edom was just a perfect man and righteous in the eyes of the Lord, Lord. And he kept all the law and all the Ten Commandments. Why was he blessed? Because of the presence of God. He understood the mercy and grace of God. And because he understood the grace and mercy of God, God gave him favor. Listen to this. I love this whenever you think about it like I do. God's presence always brings blessing. You know, it was God's heart from the beginning for the box to live with the children of Israel so it would be a blessing, not a curse. You know, and it's so unfortunate that whenever people read the Old Testament, they don't understand how to approach God, so they think that every time this box kills someone, that that was what God wanted. No, God had to do that because if you break the type and shadow of the box, then you break the type and shadow of Jesus. You know, you can't approach Jesus with how good you are. You'll be judged for your sin. You can't stand before Jesus someday and go, you know what, I kept all your commandments. Well, you're lying. You're judged for it. But when you approach him under his blood, and you say, Father, I throw myself on your mercy and your grace, you know, the grace of God covers all your sin. Amen? Listen to it like this. God's presence always brings a blessing. These are just some of the things that the Bible says God's presence does. It brings abundance into your life. It brings comfort. These are the verses that go with it. Deliverance, encouragement, favor, forgiveness, healing, all those, plus more. Joy, love, patience, peace, protection, prosperity, rest, strength, wisdom, everything is found in God's presence. If you want to experience it, now, now, by a show of hands, check this out. Those of you in Peru, all right, those of you up there, those of you everywhere, let me ask you this. Have you ever been having a bad day? Turn on some worship music and you're on your way? Then all of a sudden what you were experiencing gets swallowed up in God's presence. And then, you know, you, went, you left the house going, bleh, 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 bleh. all right? And then you're driving down the road, you turn on something and it's stirred on the inside of you. And it's amazing, you walk into to work, you're like, what, baby, we got it all to get, what's up, and they're like, what, you know, they, they didn't see you 30 minutes earlier when you were a mess, they see you now walking in, they're like, he's always happy, no, no, he's just been in God's presence, and the things that he was struggling with got swallowed up in God's presence, because his presence is more powerful than your pain, his presence is more powerful than anything you could ever have in your life. Amen? Come on. It's the truth. So whenever I think about why I love God's house, it's because of his presence. It's his presence. Listen to this last point. When God's presence touches your life, his presence becomes your purpose in your life. It really is true. I live for God's presence. Live for it. Love it. Can't wait. Whenever 
I'm not going to tell you about this building, but I remember working at the phone company. And I loved it whenever I had jobs in the central part of Kokomo. All right? I had an SBC truck, and we were allowed to just do whatever, be wherever we wanted to go for our lunch. I would drive to the old church building, and I would spend my whole lunch just worshiping God. Back then, you know, I could run the sound. I can't even turn it on in this building. But, but I could run the sound, you know, and I would turn it on. I'd have some Michael W. Smith going on, and then I'd go. I'd, I know you guys aren't like me. I like all kinds. I'd go from that to Ty Tribbett to Clint Brown to Kurt Franklin to we do all kinds of genres of music, praise God. But you know what? All those facilitated God's presence. And that's all I was worried about. I just wanted God's presence, and I wanted more of God's presence. And when that gets a hold of you, it can't help but impact you. It can't help but become your purpose in life, that you want to experience that presence. Listen to this. Obed-Edom. His name means servant. Obed means servant. All right? Listen to this. Listen to about Obed-Edom in his place. It says, and he appointed, this, this is First uh, Chronicles 16, so later on down in the, the Bible, you'll find these verses, and they're pretty powerful if you think about it. So Obed-Edom had this box for three months in his house. David comes and takes the box, the presence of God. Obed-Edom says, you know what? Hold up. I'm not staying here. If that box is going, I'm going with it, praise God. It's what took me from there to here. Wherever it goes, baby, that's where I'm going. So what happens? Look at this. And so he appointed some of the Levites to minister to, before the ark of the Lord. To commemorate, to thank and to praise. I tell you, if you want to experience God's presence, that's all you got to do. It's not hard. For the Lord is good. Come on, Psalms 100.5. All right? For the Lord is good. He's good. You start worshiping, praising God. It's amazing how big God gets and how small your problems are. Because they get consumed by God's presence. It says, to thank God and to praise the Lord God of Israel. Watch this. Asaph, the chief, and the next to him was Zechariah, and then Zia, and then Bob, and Fred, and Wilma, and Flintstones, and all those were there. Watch this. And guess who found his way into the group? Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom said, wherever that box is going, I'm going. And guess what? Y'all want to sing? I got something to sing about, praise God. I'm going to sing and worship before that box because all I want to do is dwell in God's presence. Now, if you think he stopped there, this brother had a problem with serving. Not like some people. Not going there. But there are some people God touches them and they don't serve. I don't know why you wouldn't want to serve God. Look at this next part. So Obed-Edom starts singing and praising. He's a part of the worship team. Slick hair, skinny jeans, ready to roll, baby. <laughs> All right? Next thing you know, what happens? Look at a couple verses later. First Chronicles 16, same chapter, a few verses later. So they left Asaph and his brother there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister before the Ark regularly. Every day, work required. And guess who's there? In Obed-Edom with his 68 brethren. I love it. Because Obed-Edom is like, we got we to gotta, we gotta get there. We got to stay in God's presence. We got to be there. When? Every day. Some of you would die if I told you you had to go to church every day. <laughs> they're there every day serving and worshiping because all they're doing is living in God's presence. Now, the powerful part of this is, get this, you ready? So Obed-Edom, and, and it goes on to say this, and 60, how many? 68 brethren, Obed-Edom got so caught up in the presence, he goes, y'all ain't never seen nothing like this before. You get caught up in this thing, this thing will, I tell you, what he did is he transferred his faith and trust in God to 68 brethren. That's pretty powerful. Because he didn't just take the presence of God and say, well, it's just all about me. It's all about me. He said, man, I want other people to experience this. You know, next weekend, Easter weekend, we want everybody to feel the presence of God. I'm of the opinion, two seconds in the presence of God, you, it does away with all arguments about, is God real? It does away with all debate. It does away, why? Because God's presence is so thick and tangible, it changes people's lives. Do you believe that? Come on, I believe that, praise God. I believe that. Let me pray for you, all right? 
Father, I thank you for your people, and I ask that you bless them, touch them, and minister to them. And Father, I thank you for your presence even right here in this place, God. We love your presence. Let your presence saturate your people, God. Let us walk, live, and move and be all about your presence, God. We love you. We thank you. And I thank you for blessing your people. I pray this week they'll be consumed by it. They'll live in it. And I believe that what your word says about Obed-Edom will be true about them. That you will bless all their household. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, come on, everybody says. Give the Lord a big, big clap. Praise God. <laughs>